you for all being here, because this is an issue that I think is enormously important, and that's energy, energy in this country, energy independence. I keep hearing this thrown around by particularly candidates in, when in the middle of a campaign, and I'm not sure there's ever any such thing as energy independence entirely. It's a fungible material, moves around the world, energy, and so whether we're totally independent or not is one thing. Can we be a whole lot less dependent on countries that don't like us very much? Absolutely, without question. We're looking, according to all the estimates, at a 28% increase in electricity demand by 2040. I think most, probably most of the people in this room understand that while that for many sounds like it's a long way away, for utility, it's yesterday. Given the size of the kind of commitment capital commitment that has to be made, the decisions that have to be made. And frankly, I think it would be enormously helpful if we could get our Congress to enact an energy plan. Uh, we haven't had one. We don't have, won't have one today. We haven't had one for a long time. And what we need is something that at least states what the goals of our energy should be. And to my mind, that's reliable, affordable, safe, environmentally clean energy. Clean, green energy that's reliable and affordable. And that, to me, gets me to the place of nuclear. Now, I should say at the onset, as a disclaimer, I chair something called, I co-chair something called Case Energy, Clean Safe Energy Coalition. CleanSafeEnergy.org mm -hmm. is, the, is the organization. Funded by the Nuclear Energy Institute, it's about getting out information on nuclear, mm -hmm. um, answering people's questions so that they can make the decision what role nuclear should play future and helping them to understand the role it does play today. Um, nuclear is almost 20% of our overall power mix in the country today, but over 60% of our clean energy. It runs at about 90% efficiency, and it takes a very small amount of uranium to produce power. And because of that, you can lock into long-term contracts on uranium in a way that you can't for natural gas or even for coal. So it helps buffer us against the fluctuations in price that we see. Today, you have, well, obviously, we have an abundance, it appears, of natural gas. And that's driving a lot of the decision making and, and driving a lot of investment on the part of utilities. And that's good. We should take advantage of what we have. The problem is, or the warning for, for me, is we've been here before. We have seen low natural gas prices. And we've seen them spike. So the concern about having a, uh, an energy source that isn't a true mix, an energy portfolio that isn't a true mix and all of the above, could put us in a position of vulnerability, given that something could easily happen to A, the supply, B, the, B, the cost of natural gas. Coal is about 48% of our energy mix today. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're not going to do away with coal tomorrow. The problem in this country is that we are very good at saying no to everything. We don't like coal because it's dirty, but we won't invest in clean coal technology. Because as of today, we really don't have a good, viable clean coal technology. We don't have scrubbers that truly capture carbon. Uh, natural gas, we want to take advantage of it, but we don't like fracking. <coughs> We don't want to really see too much more of that. And of course, the other thing to remember is that there's a quite a substantial, usually, uh, depending on how they're doing it, but there can be a substantial leak of methane when you are extracting the natural gas or the fracking process, and that's an environmental issue. And then, of course, we don't, but we don't want a natural gas pipeline here because it might blow up. And we're even not so sure about windmills, because birds don't look the same when they come out of a windmill as they did going into a windmill. So we can come up with reasons not to do just about everything. Nuclear is one of those sources of energy that has a legacy that is extremely mixed in this country. Not factually, but emotionally. Because if you look at it, we've had some 104 nuclear reactors around the country. There are about 100 operating today. They've been operating for over 50 years, and they've been enormously safe. We had one major incident, not wood, one major incident, and that was Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island was a partial meltdown in the core of a reactor. No question about it. It was something that shouldn't have happened, 
actually it probably wouldn't have happened if the operators at the time hadn't overridden the system and uh, caused the reactor not to do some things that it was programmed to do, which actually would have prevented the meltdown. But the good news on Three Mile Island is that even the operators of the plant who were inside the reactor at the time were not exposed to overly high doses of radiation. They have been followed now for years, and there are no cancer clusters. There's nothing that says that they were exposed to high levels. So the message there is, while it should never have happened, and it was a wake-up call for the industry and resulted in a lot more training for operators and another whole level of security being added, the people in the community were always safe. But the trouble was Three Mile Island happened right after Chernobyl and almost the day before the release of the China Syndrome movie with Jane Fonda. And that was sort of the perfect confluence. At the same time, back in 1970s, uh, we had, when we had seen the arms race in the 1970s, and around about 1970, Jimmy Carter, President Carter, had said, because people were mixing nuclear power with nuclear weaponry, we're out of the business. We're not going to do any more nuclear. And that really stopped new investment in nuclear technology in this country. So we've had these 104 reactors, mixing between 100 and 104, operating since then. And they've operated, as I said, about 90% efficiency. And from outside sources are deemed some of the safest places to work in the country. That's largely because we have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is a watchdog that is constantly, it is a constant presence actually at every reactor. They have outside scientists at every reactor who have 24-7 uh, access to the reactors. They can go in, they can see what's happening, they can raise the red flag when they need to. And it is a place where you have constantly evolving regulations and security. I mean, for instance, after 9-11, one of the things that the nuclear industry did and the, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission required was that in looking at 9-11, not that it had anything to do with nuclear, they said one of the things we ought to do is move the backup generators from co-locations with the reactors themselves. That happened for us in 9-11. Fast forward to Fukushima Daiichi, what happened in Fukushima Daiichi was not the earthquake. The earthquake wasn't what caused the problem. The reactors closed, shut down, did what they were supposed to do. It was the tsunami. And part of the problem with that was they had co-located their generators right next to the reactors. So when the generators were flooded, you didn't have the power anymore to cool the holding ponds. We won't face that kind of a problem here. Our reactors are, the, it's not to say we won't face problems or couldn't. <clears throat> you can never say never. And obviously there are always concerns. And that's why there's constant updating. At, right after Fukushima Daiichi, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission started another deep dive into what the lessons learned are from that, as did the industry itself, because of their concerns about what could happen. And they came out within six months, the NRC came out with another set of regulations, a new hardening of targets, things that the, that the utilities needed to do. And that's a continuing process. And the utilities themselves are, are looking at that. What can we do to make sure we're safe? The other good thing about nuclear, from my mind, is because it is the only form of base power that releases no greenhouse gases or other regulated pollutants when it's producing power. In this country, our nuclear reactors on an annual basis avoid the uh, emissions of some set 570 metric tons of carbon dioxide. That's the equivalent of what would be released from every passenger car in the United States. I care about climate change. Um, I know there are all sorts of arguments about it. I don't think that you can say with a straight face that the climate isn't changing. If you do, I would argue that you probably haven't been outside or read a newspaper, looked at television in the last few years. We can argue over what kind of an impact, what role humans play in that, because clearly the Earth has been changing since it was formed. We didn't mess up the Ice Age. We know we had it, and we know it went away. So, I mean, that wasn't us. Clearly, the Earth has been changing. However, I think it's also extremely naive to assume that what we have done to land mass and changes from deforestation, farming, and development, and what we put into the atmosphere haven't had an impact on nature. And while I don't believe we can stop climate change, I do believe we can slow it down. And I think we are seeing on a regular basis the kind of impact that climate change has on us and the need to plan for what we're going to face. 
as sea levels rise, as we have ever more frequent storms, and severity of storms, floods, droughts, all of those things, we need to be prepared for those. In fact, the United States last year spent $100 billion on recovery from natural disasters. And that added up to about $300 for every person in the country. That's real money coming out of our pockets. So as we look at our energy mix, we want it to be clean, we want it to be green, we want it to be reliable, we want it to be affordable. So that brings us to the renewables. Renewables now, if you take the, the high end, are about 10% and growing, but about 10% of our overall energy mix. If we really are facing, as we are, I believe, a 28% increase in power demand by 2040 and increasing after that, you can't gear up renewables to meet that in that time frame. Plus the fact that we still haven't figured out how to store renewable energy. They're peak shaving, not base power. So every nuclear, I mean every, excuse me, every renewable, whether it's a, a windmill or solar, has to have backup power behind it. So they all have a base power source for those times when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. And that gets us back to what is the cleanest form of that base power. And of course we have uh, many people looking to the future of electric vehicles and what a difference that will make, which they will. They'll make a huge difference on what will be emitted into the atmosphere. But you have to get right back to they're really only as clean as the power used to charge them. So that gets back to that base power. All of those things are the reason why uh, I spent some time with Case, which is, a, by the way, a uh, membership a grassroots organization. We have some oh, th over 3,000 members, and members include everything from organizations like um, business groups, chambers of commerce, health groups, universities, uh, labor unions, to individuals, people who care. And the reason behind it, the thinking behind it, is that when it comes time for a uh, leader, a decision maker, to decide what kind of energy mix they want, because these decisions are being made at the state level every day. The federal government may not be able to get itself together. State governments are moving ahead. And when it comes time for them to make these decisions, it helps them to be able to look over their shoulder and see that their respected opinion leaders who say you're not crazy to consider this as part of the mix. I am always very careful to say to people, this is not a silver bullet. Nuclear power is not a silver bullet. We are a country that loves to be told there's one thing we need to do, and if we do that, we'll solve all the problems, and then we'll do it better than anybody else in the world. But there is no silver bullet, particularly in energy. Really, there is no silver bullet on anything much in the world, but certainly not on energy. We're going to need it all of the above. We're not going to be able to replace coal overnight. We should take advantage of natural gas as we have it um, when we can. We just shouldn't rely totally on any one source of energy. And because of my concern about air quality and about climate change, I want to see us keep nuclear at at least 19, if not 20% of our power generating mix as we move forward. We have four reactors being built today, two in South Carolina, two in Georgia. There's some dozen that are in the queue, as it were, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for permitting. They've, the utilities have stopped pushing those in the way they were before because of the access to natural gas and the cost of acquiring that natural gas, of extracting that natural gas. But they're there. I hope that we do eventually, if we were to eventually get a, uh, a clear message on where we're going with carbon and what is going to be required of our utilities, whether it is finally deciding the court cases on EPA regulations on carbon or wonder wonders if Congress passes something like a national energy plan. Um, I don't hold my breath for that one, but uh, we will get some solution, uh, resolution to what's happening with the, uh, the carbon cap uh, standards that EPA is putting forward. So with that, I will stop and we can get into questions and answers. Governor, thank you. Uh, let me introduce Andrew Holland. He's our senior fellow for energy and climate here and uh, conversant on these issues. Andrew, I think you've got a few comments and then we'll probably turn it over to Q&A. Yeah, great. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I'm, I'll just start by saying what a, an honor it is to, uh, to be on the same stage here with, uh, with Governor Whitman. Uh, she
she was my governor when I was uh, growing up. You were big. <laughs> no, no, no. When I was first coming into into politics, uh, and I and I first worked uh, here in D.C. Uh, back in 2001 and 2002 uh, for a New Jersey representative, Mr. Rockwell. Uh, so I, I remember going and, and uh, sitting in the back of meetings with uh, Governor Whitman when she was the PA administrator. So it's an honor for me to be uh, uh, working with her at, at ASP. Um, are we not on? Technical problems. Now we'll have to wait. So I turn you down. <laughs> How are we now? Very good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, all of that's to say uh, that it's a great honor to be uh, on the stage here uh, with her. Um, I am ASP's Energy and Climate um, Fellow. That means that you know, we look at, at all sorts of energy, from nuclear uh, to the energies of today, oil, gas, uh, to the energy uh, systems of tomorrow, uh, next generation nuclear, uh, fusion, uh, renewables, uh, the whole gamut of things, things like space-based solar power, stuff that's you know seems seems crazy in the future uh, now, but maybe will be. Uh, uh, ready in the future. So, um, I have some good questions about uh, nuclear power, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of try and tee some up for you, uh, and hopefully we can get a good discussion going, then I'm going to open it to the floor, uh, and, uh, and we can go from there. So my, my first question is, you, you mentioned it a little bit, but not, not too much, uh, Yucca Mountain and waste and what you do uh, with nuclear waste. Uh, right now, 104 reactors operating in the country. Uh, all of them are keeping their waste on site. And even reactors that have closed still have their waste sitting on site. Um, and this is, if it's not a safety issue, it's also a, it's an open legal liability for all of the companies. Uh, and the government is committed to building a waste repository, has built a waste repository, uh, but as you said, uh, we're very good at saying no. And this is another example of, of something we're saying no. Um, the President uh, had a Blue Ribbon Commission on this, uh, reported a, a year and a half ago. Um, wondering what, what your view is on, on what's next for, for nuclear waste, where we go from here, how we rectify this, and then, you know, is this something that, that once we figure it out, maybe this could open the, the floodgates a bit for these, these um, other things. Yeah, that, Andrew, that's the number one question that, that I get. Am I on? Switch it over. Okay. Um, that's really the number one question that I get when I get around. What do you do with the nuclear waste? And I'd first like to describe the parameters of the issue which we're dealing, the 104 reactors operating for some 50 years. If you took all the spent rods that we have, those reactors and put them all together in one place end to end, you'd fill up one football field to the height of the goalposts, which is kind of different in people's minds. They tend to think in terms of an insurmountable amount, I mean, the size of the state of Maine or something. And then you say, also, it is not gas, it's not liquid that's in there, they're pellets. I mean, should those ever be breached? You don't want to be standing near them, don't get me wrong, but you're not going to get a sudden release into the groundwater or a sudden mushroom cloud. But having said that, and having said that, they are, they are stored on site in underground, uh, underwater ponds or above ground heavily reinforced steel and concrete bunkers. In fact, for every um, 10 tons of material that is being stored there, there are 100 tons of concrete and steel around them. That's the, the measurement to which they do it. Having said that, it's not ideal. And the Congress determined it wasn't ideal. They said there should be one national repository, not 95 different sites uh, around the country, because you have several reactors on one site in, in many places. Um, and they determined also that it should be Yucca Mountain in Nevada. And what's stopping Yucca Mountain is has nothing to do with science science and everything to do with political science. As long as Harry Reid is head of the Senate, we're not going to have Yucca Mountain. Have, although we have spent literally billions of dollars of our money, taxpayer and ratepayers' money, on 
getting the outcome out and done. Interestingly enough, the courts, I think it was yesterday, decided that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission can no longer collect from the utilities. They've been collecting money right along from the utilities to pay for Yucca Mountain as well as for what the government's been putting in. And of course, since we're not going ahead with Yucca Mountain issues and we don't have a site, uh, the government hasn't picked, the, the Blue Ribbon Commission came back and said maybe two, one or two other sites should be looked at and there are some that have raised their uh, areas, that have raised their hands and said we'll take it. Um, they, the court has said that, that the utilities are not surprised to sue and said you've got to stop this effectively at a tax on us and uh, our, our ratepayers and stop this because we're not going anywhere. So that, that decision was made. The really frustrating thing is that you have in those spent rods some 95 to 97 percent fissionable material for unused energy. And that's just sitting there. You can reprocess or recycle that and get it down to 2 to 3 percent. That's being done in France. It's been done in Japan. Actually, the French technology was first invented or here, and then when we got out of the business back in the 1970s and said we're not going to do any more nuclear, um, the French took it up and they have been working it since then and have taken it to the next level. It's highly enriched plutonium when you finish with that process, but they have also figured a way, don't ask me because I'm not a nuclear scientist, how to ensure that that's never weapons grade. And so um, what you have is a potential, in fact, sitting in those rods to power this country for quite some time to come. We just reprocess it, but we stopped making the investment back in the 70s. Now, this administration has not only supported, said they support nuclear, but has put some more money in the DOE budget for research and development on both reprocessing and small modular reactors, which are the kind of the next generation of nuclear won't solve all problems, but have great potential for certain areas of the country. Um, and so we have this, we have this potential. It is something that could unlock the future and also make people feel much better about nuclear reactors. Although the interesting thing, in this country, even after Fukushima Daiichi, there were polls done and over 50% of the American people still supported nuclear. And the closer you get to a reactor, and there have been studies, Biscotte Research did um, a study that showed that even excluding people who actually worked at the reactor, um, you had an 81% support <coughs> for nuclear in those communities because they understand that it was something I didn't mention, the jobs aspect of it. I would never tell anyone that they should make a decision as to whether or not to have nuclear based on jobs, but given the situation we're in, it's a fair thing to have as part of the equation. And a nuclear reactor, during construction, it's anywhere from 1,500 to 3,500 jobs. And actually, uh, in some of the uh, mobile plants, I believe, right now, the two that are being built, it's up to about 5,000 jobs. Or they think it will be 5,000 at the peak of construction. And then you have between, uh, depending on the size of the reactors, the number of reactors, anywhere from three to 500 permanent full-time jobs. And jobs in a nuclear reactor pay some 36% more than a similar job in that community. Each one of our reactors throws off some $470 million annually to the local community, and some $40 million in um, salaries and bonuses. And for every job at a nuclear reactor, about 66 uh, support jobs, as it were, contract jobs, other jobs that are created in the, in the local community. So there are, they are big job producers, and the jobs are good. And it's the whole pipeline. It's not just, you don't have to be a nuclear scientist to work at a nuclear reactor. They have janitors. They have security people uh, during construction. Obviously, they, they need electricity. They need cement. They need wiring. They're, that's why you see this, this whole panoply of, of jobs being can be created around a nuclear reactor. So that's why those who live close to reactors good neighbors and they also know that their power is reliable and their power is less expensive because on a per, per kilowatt basis nuclear is the least expensive of the base powers and very competitive and sometimes less than wind or solar. Let's talk about what, what the next generation is. You were talking about this and it's one of these things where if, if we just do nothing, if we just continue to say no, uh, as you say, uh, a lot of these reactors are going to start to run up against their, their lifetime. Uh, and they're going to have to be closed or 
you know, we've already seen the, the NRC uh, relicense a number for, for an additional 20 years. But at some point over the next decade, a number are going to either have to be substantially uh, redone or, or closed. Uh, so if we do nothing, we're not going to have 104 reactors uh, in 2025. Uh, so you mentioned SMRs. Uh, and you know the, the new generation that's being built uh, is it the AP1000 uh, and and these these other reactors are, is these are are not the same reactors as Three Mile Island. These are not the same uh, nuclear. Uh, it's substantially different. Uh, and and then what's what's the next step from there? What should we be thinking of as as nuclear of, of 2025, 2030? Well, the good news uh, for the future is that of the 104 reactors we have had over time in this country, about 95 use different technologies. So a utility couldn't even put somebody in one reactor, train somebody for one reactor, and move them to, the, to another reactor that they owned necessarily because it would be a different technology. Now there are, as you point out, uh, four being built here, all using the AP Westinghouse 1000, AP 1000 technology. There are probably going to be maybe four different technologies if you look at what's being built around the world, no more than four. What that means is that when they go through the licensing process, after the first one of a new technology has been licensed, then the NRC is going to know what to look for. And it's going to go up a learning curve. They didn't have that in the past. The NRC has also done something else to help expedite the construction, which is they've moved to what I would call a D-bomb approach, design, build, maintain, operate. In the past, every time a new reactor was going to be brought online or being proposed, the utility had to come in to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission every step of the way. They had to come in with the site, and they had to come in with the technology, they had to come in before they broke ground, they had to come in with the cement, and every time they came in, that gave a chance for interveners to be heard, and it slowed the process and added to the cost. Now what they're doing is requiring that a utility come in with all the same answers, but all up front. And so there's a full opportunity for interveners to see what they're dealing with and to respond to that and to bring whatever concerns they have to the fore. But once that uh, permit is given, they're good to go. I mean, obviously the NRC is going to be watching to make sure that they, they meet the standards that they've set and they're doing what they said they're going to do, but they don't have to keep coming back to the NRC each time which should move the process forward and help keep the costs in line. That's going to be an incentive once we decide really where we're going on natural gas, and where the utilities want to make their, their investment. Small modular reactors are going to be very good for rural areas that don't have access to power. I mean, the thing about it is, if you think about now, a nuclear reactor, the footprint of a nuclear reactor <coughs> All in is about a square mile. The reactor itself is much smaller than that, but the buffer area means it comes out to about a square mile, and most of that is in um, land, open land, set aside natural habitat. For an equivalent sized uh, a, a wind farm, you would have to have some 224 square miles. That's huge. You only find those in places where there's really nothing much else around, which is fine, and, and where the wind blows a lot. Wyoming, you've heard a lot about Wyoming, Montana. The problem is you then have the, the issue of the infrastructure, and you have to get that power to something. And that, of course, brings us to a whole other issue, which is our infrastructure, which, again, from a national security point of view, is as important, if not more important, than we discussed, because our infrastructure is old, even if we bring on no new not another kilowatt of power. We're going to need to do something about it to upgrade it. You hear about the smart grid. There are investments being made there. So you have to look at energy as, a, as an entire picture. You can't just say we're going to do one thing or the other because we need to look at it all and understand it all. It's going to cost more money over time. But if I were to make my investments, I like the idea that we're, they're putting money into the small modular reactors. That, that those are essentially what happens with those is they can make them in, one, in the factory put them together in the factory, move them to where they're going to be, set them on the ground, and turn them off. They're much smaller. They're easier to, to deal with. Uh, they're easier, you could argue, easier to protect, and they produce less waste. They're not going to solve the needs, though, for a big city or a major city. They're, they're still, we're still going to need the big 1,000 megawatt reactors. Uh, you're not going to get away with the 300 
her, her major power source. So we're going to need both, and I would hope that we start to really look seriously at the reprocessing. That's where we need to put more money, as well as understanding we continue to work on one thing we don't, haven't talked about is conservation. Let's start with how do we stop using wasting energy. It's not the using energy, it's the wasting energy. And perhaps the toughest message there to people is to say, you know what, individual behavior has a cumulative impact. If everybody would just unplug their charger when they're finished charging their iPhones, it sounds stupid and small, but guess what, it adds up, it makes a difference. Um, there's a lot more, as you know, everybody's, uh, there's a big push to change our light bulbs, and people think, this is ridiculous, it doesn't make any difference, it does. Uh, perhaps the best analogy, and it's not in the energy sector, it's in the water sector, but there's as much oil deposited along the coastline United States every eight months from non-point source pollution, meaning people who don't deal with, you know, a leaky, leaky oil pan and drive around with it, or change the oil in their car and don't dispose of it correctly. As much oil deposited along the coastline United States from that kind of behavior every eight months as was released during the Exxon Valdez spill. When you think about it, that's a huge amount of pollution that we're contributing, and it's, it's each one of us is just not taking time to do things the right way. And the same thing's true of power. So I do also think we need to uh, take another look at how do we encourage some uh, conservation and then look at what we can do to improve the other forms of green power. Yeah. Well, uh, we've got some good, good amount of time here, so I'm going to open it up to the audience here. Uh, I'll ask you, I'll call on you, and then I'll ask you to wait for the microphone to come around, uh, identify yourself, and uh, we can go from there. So, right here. Hi. Uh, hi. Every single mic apparently yeah. is on. Did you unmute it? Hello. <laughs> I think the mics are just recording purposes. That's why they need it on. Hi. Uh, yeah, that's why. You're wrong. <laughs> Matt Bandick with SNL Energy. Um, you mentioned that the uh, safety record of uh, nuclear plants has been uh, a lot, uh, a lot better than maybe uh, in the popular eye. But what about the uh, the economics? Um, a lot of nuclear plants have ended up being much more expensive to build than was uh, anticipated, um, and that's a uh, been a big concern with the, the new ones in Georgia and South Carolina. Um, what is the, the danger there of cost overruns kind of souring the, uh, the appeal of building new nuclear plants? Sure. Well, that's obviously a real concern of the utilities themselves, and that has been a, a major problem in the past. That's one of the reasons why the NRC did change their um, licensing process, because that helps reduce that. So far, at the four reactors that are being built, the two in Georgia, two in South Carolina, they're on budget. I mean, obviously with any big, big construction thing, you can run into, and you will run into problems. I mean, you'll have weather-related slowdowns, for instance, times when you can't pour concrete, when you can't do certain things, and that can slow it down and add to the cost. But right now, averaging out over those four nuclear reactors, they're each, it comes out to about $8 billion a reactor, which is less than it was back in the old days, building them at 12 to 14 billion. So it is It is less, and they're so far on time and on budget. I mean, I think, um, I think it's, I can't remember whether it was Georgia or South Carolina, maybe a couple of months behind schedule, but not anything, not years the way you saw in the past. The other part of this is that it, by having, using the same technology, you're also going to speed up the process because the people who are constructing, overseeing the construction, again, know what to look for. And of course, these reactors are uh, technologies that are being used in other places around the world. I mean, there are nuclear reactors being built all across the world. In fact, there are four AP-1000s being built in China today that are producing some 1,900 jobs already in this country. 99% or 90% of the component parts for those reactors are being made here in the United States, and the same for the four that are being built right now in this country. So that's always a concern. It seems to be less of a concern than it's been in the past because that was one of the focus points of uh, 
the utilities when they were looking at how, whether or not to go forward. The question of economics also brings up uh, the dreaded S word, subsidies. Uh, you know, I, I hear, especially from opponents of nuclear, that, oh, the government has to subsidize it. Uh, and then I think, well, doesn't the government subsidize almost every sort of, of energy? Uh, whether you talk about green subsidies, which are the ones in the news now, but still uh, oil is, oil and gas production is subsidized. Um, is it fair to expect nuclear to, uh, to move away from subsidies, uh, or, or should it be subsidized? Is this something that, that we should? Well, as you point out, every form of, of power really gets some kind of subsidy, and, and nuclear has had less actually on a percentage basis than uh, wind or solar, mm -hmm. and they draw down less. But what's happening with these utilities, that the, the four that are being built now, what they're looking for is um, guarantees, loan guarantees. They don't want to take the loans if they don't have to, but they want the guarantees. Actually, the four that are going forward, they have said they'll go forward without the loan guarantees. They're, they believe the economics are such that they can go forward without them. But it's not so much that they're getting loans to build. What they need, though, if you think about it, because of the size of the construction and the amount of money that's required, $8 billion is a lot of money. When they go to the lenders, the lenders need to see, because of the history of nuclear in this country particularly, of being in of it, and then all of a sudden the government saying, we're out of it, that the stutter start, it's a big investment to make to think that the government may suddenly step in and say, we don't want any more nuclear. So they need to have that assurance that the, governor, the government will be there uh, should something happen, that there will at least be a fallback if the government starts to put too many obstacles in the way, that they will have already established that fallback. And so um, it's something that I think is going to be necessary for the future, hopefully for a while anyway, hopefully as we move forward and the NRC gets more comfortable with the technology and the utilities get more comfortable with the technology, so there'll be less and less need for it. As I say, the four that are going forward now have said they're fully prepared and they are going forward without the loan guarantee. So it is economically viable to, to do that, but I don't think you can expect to do all the retrofits that are going to be required, to keep the aging plants going and making those kind of continuous capital investments. Uh, but depending on where we end up with the carbon you know, standards, that's going to require huge investments on everybody's part. I don't care what kind of, of energy you're talking about, at least for the base powers. And um, and it's going to it's going to have an impact even on the renewables. Yeah, in a carbon constrained world, the constrained world the nuclear is is has a, a benefit, yeah. uh, an economic that's benefit. Gonna, that's going to be a real boost to um, Who else? Someone over here. Make sure. Hi, I'm uh, Lauren Gardner with CQ Roll Call. Uh, Governor, what is your take on the court decisions this week on their impact on a legislative approach to trying to deal with the nuclear waste question? There's legislation in the Senate that's been works for several years. If, with Harry Reid leading the Senate, there won't be Yucca, but with him leading the Senate, could there be another solution to the nuclear waste question? Do I think we'll come up with another, with some other sites? I know there are some um, communities that have said, some states that have said, we're willing to do this because they see it as being a um, money generator. They think they can make money off it and they're willing to accept them. So far, I haven't heard much of anything happening about designating those sites and getting through the NIMBY, which will be inevitable. Um, the pushback that, that they'll probably get from some of the local communities. But you know, we've been moving nuclear around this country, around the world. Think of the nuclear navy. I mean, that, and that's another thing actually we didn't even touch on is when you talk about retirement of the nuclear reactors themselves, you've got almost 50% of the current nuclear workforce eligible to retire in the next five years. Um, we need to make an investment in training people. People are going to have the skills to do the work uh, at a nuclear reactor because that's going to be a big challenge for them. But I haven't seen much effort, but that doesn't mean it isn't happening. I just don't know about it. I, I think, but backing up in my heart of hearts, I don't think Yucca Mountain is dead. They've also been required to go ahead with uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has been required to go ahead with their safety analysis that they started and then stopped. Uh, when I was at EPA, we were, it was at the point where we 
had to determine the uh, water standard, whether it was going to be a groundwater standard or a drinking water standard around Yucca Mountain. I picked the drinking water standard because that was, to me, the more protective uh, for the people and they needed that level of assurance. The problem is that the way it's set up, you're supposed to guarantee that, be able to guarantee that for 10,000 years. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in 10 years with technology, much less 10,000. But we still thought that the NRC, that the utility could meet it, that the NRC could meet it, Department of Energy, which would oversee it, that that would be a suitable standard. Well, we got sued by everybody, not surprised. <laughs> happens at EPA. And um, the environmentalist won a suit saying that 10,000 years wasn't protective enough. So the EPA came back and said, okay, we'll make it a million years. And that to me is a disservice to the public because everybody was. It said, you can't guarantee anything like that. And to say that's the guarantee you're putting around something really undermines your confidence. And how serious are you? I mean, what, what's real here? A million years you can guarantee for me? We may not have a planet in a million years for Pete's sakes. Um, I don't know how you're you're going to do this. So it's a it's a it's a it's a problem, but it's not an insoluble problem. That's the that's the frustrating part of it. We do have solutions. To these Other things. countries have done it. Other and countries have done it and are doing it. And, uh, uh, and the military has done it. The, the, U military the U.S. military has done it. a repository. The military has been a repository, and that's actually where most of the uh, new nuclear scientists are coming from a retired Navy personnel. And we forget the other the other thing about nuclear that has just changed, 20% of our nuclear power up until recently has come from reprocessed nuclear warheads from Russia. And it was part of the uh, no nukes agreement. Unfortunately, they now that's kind of run out and they've discovered they can make money from this. So we've had our last shipment of, of the nuclear warheads. Now we're going to have to pay for it. It was free before. but. Um, you know, you can do this. You can reprocess. You can reuse nuclear uh, fuel and do it in a way that makes sense for everybody. Uh, Mark, I'm trying here. Mark. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mark Haynes with Concordia Power. <coughs> uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, when you were citing statistics on power mix, I think you were talking just about electric power. So for example, you said 20% nuclear is part of the power mix. Actually, it's, that's just if the electric power right, side. That's same just electric. same right. with renewables that you yeah. cite is 10%. Well, right. of that's electric. electric, and most of that actually is hydro, by the way. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you know and hydro is pretty well built out in this country. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so electric power itself is about 38% how much power we use in the U.S. Industrial is about 20%. Transportation is, I think, around 40% or so. That's a large. Yeah. No, I think actually transportation is around 30. But anyway, the, so the point being that over 50% of the power we use is for things other Not than it. electric power. And actually, ironically, in terms of greenhouse gas, electric power is the least carbon intensive of the major chunks. So for those of us in the nuclear industry, we sort of look at, well, if nuclear is going to be most relevant to climate change, um, then you need to move it, in essence, its benefits into these other sectors, industry and, and transportation. Could you speak to that a little bit in, in the future of nuclear power? Well, that's why the uh, focus on the electric vehicle, because of the amount of uh, emissions from the mobile sources is so great, and the overall power mix, the power they use, what we import in order to produce the gasoline that, that powers our vehicles, that, that alone would have an enormous impact where we'd move it to the electric vehicle as long as the power produced for that electric vehicle is a clean source of power, a green source of power, reduced power, reduced emissions power. So um, if that is, if you're right, there. that's why we need to look at houses. Houses are not in and of themselves, that an individual house isn't the biggest source of power usage, but everything that goes into a house from construction all the way through is the biggest source of, of power utilization and then what you have in the house. So um, it, it, all, it all revolves around, at the end of the day, we could have a huge impact on emissions, we could have a huge impact on our reliance on foreign sources for the various forms of power that we use, not electricity, but power. Were we to uh, 
at least be able to get some of our biggest users onto something like nuclear power. That for, for instance, the vehicles. That makes it that would make a big difference. It would make a big difference in our import of foreign oil and gas. It would make a, a big difference in our emissions. So those things, it's, it's all interrelated, but you're right, we're talking electricity on any of the uh, statistics that I cited, not in power in general. Electric vehicles, as well, trains for inter, inter city transportation. And, and Light rail, I mean, that, that's all part of what I think we need to look at when we're looking at how we rebuild after some of these major storms and where we rebuild and what we do for sustainable development. And I keep saying to people, you know, sustainable development doesn't mean no development. What it means is developing so your children and grandchildren can live here. Um, and that does mean taking into account how we are, the, the pressure we're going to put on our infrastructure and the, the energy infra infrastructure being one of those places where we have to be mindful. We need to be looking at it. Do you want to follow up, Mark? Yeah, good. Um. <laughs> Just another way, you, you had touched on the issue of sort of next generation power. Uh, there are future reactor types, more than one time, that uh, operate at much higher temperatures and have different safety cases than today's. Not that today's is bad at all, but uh, even better safety case in nuclear that operate at higher temperatures and therefore, you know, in, for example, in the industrial sector, could be used for process heat and substitute for the massive amounts of natural gas or liquid fuels now. So hold beyond just the electric yeah. power there, there part are a lot of the equation. exciting things going on. And I just note that it, 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 or follow up on what you had said about the DOEs and the, this administration's push in that regard. It's not a very good push. <laughs> it, uh, that it's kind of really pitiful. And the rea reality about nuclear, as you noted, particularly next generation nuclear, uh, like uh, any advanced energy technology sort of this valley of death that uh, you get to a certain point and you've got to take stuff out of the labs and, and get it commercialized and nuclear because it is so expensive in part because of the licensing and regulation the government is really needed for that lift and uh, one other thing every other government in the world that has a nuclear program is good at doing that that lift yeah. we're not and that's a national security issue because as they grow stronger in the world of nuclear and we grow weaker in these new technologies, uh, we become less influential, less informed about what's going on around the world and in things nuclear. Well, if you look at, at energy, it's uh, one of the things that's been very troubling to me from a security point of view is the emergence of Russia and its willingness to use power as a political tool. And you see it doing it right now in the stands other countries that are dependent on it. And what's been interesting is when uh, Angela Merkel, after Fukushima Daiichi, when Angela Merkel said, right, Germany is off nuclear. We're going to close down all our nuclear. We're not going to do any more nuclear. That was as much a reaction, I believe, to the as fact that she had lost a couple of by-elections just prior to that to the Green parties. And it was a political reaction more than an actual energy reaction. And, and what she's, what they're finding now in Germany is, and what bothered me in the whole Russian link is that they've given Russia much more power, because that their nuclears are primarily in the Ruhr Valley, which is of course their industrial heartland. They are finding that their cost of power is rising dramatically, and they're blowing through all of their budgets for Kyoto, all of their targets that they agreed to on reducing uh, emissions from Kyoto. So they've got a real problem now to try to think about that, but what worries me, and because you see it happening, is Putin's willingness to use power as a, as a political tool, and of course when you have fewer reactors producing power for countries like Germany, they've got to get their power from somewhere else. They're going to be buying it, and what they take is not going to go to some of these other places. It's going to make them even more reliant on Russian power, and the that for a an overall. I mean, it may not be an immediate threat to the United States, but it makes me nervous, and it's something I think we ought to be watching very carefully. What else? One in the back here. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Governor Whitman. My name is Lauren Dickerson. I work for the United States Energy Association here in Washington. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to comment on the lack of growth in nuclear power in competitive power markets. We see four new reactors being built in regulated power markets. In competitive power markets, uh, there have been a number of nuclear reactors that have been announced to the, to the NRC. Uh, we're seeing a tremendous amount of coal retirements, particularly in the Midwest. And that, to me, seems like a tremendous opportunity for the nuclear industry to ramp up uh, in other parts of the country other than just the southeast. But due to the very competitive uh, prices of natural gas, we're probably not going to see uh, new nuclear build-outs in, in places where they could really use it. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and maybe make a couple of recommendations for either state or even federal uh, policymakers and regulators on that subject. Well, probably the, the best advice that I would give those policymakers and regulators is to start dealing with this issue now. Because you're absolutely right. You're seeing the retirement of coal-fired power plants, um, and that's leaving a gap. And you've got to look at where that gap's going to come from. Right now, everyone is, is running toward natural gas. You're seeing pushback on fracking. You're seeing, you saw a whole bunch of referendums in the last election cycle. Colorado particularly, where uh, the communities just banned fracking here in the end. So it's going to be a, <clears throat> it's not a smooth path forward for <clears throat> natural gas. And that's why organizations like CASE, why CASE was created uh, to try to give some support to those decision makers, whether it's the governors or the boards of public utilities, public utility commissions, whatever they're called, to know that there are there are reasons, good reasons, to be considering nuclear as part of their mix. Many of them are going to want to, and particularly in the western states, I think, look at the small modular reactors, which are not ready for prime time yet. Um, there are some being used in other parts of the world, but we haven't really, um, we're not at a place to roll them out in this country yet. We should get there. We should get there fast. We ought to be looking at that, and they ought to be working with their utilities to see what it will take from a regulatory perspective. Obviously, the big concern for utilities is recovering, rate recovery, and it's how you do that. Florida moved ahead with that. Uh, South Carolina and Georgia have done it in a way that allows the utility to start collecting on the rates as they build. And so it, what it does is allows them to get the money in to subsidize the construction of the new nuclear reactors. And it prevents the, the rate payer from suddenly facing a cliff at the end of the day when the nuclear reactor is turned on, all of a sudden their rates spike up. As I said, once online, a nuclear reactor on a per kilowatt basis is the least expensive of the uh, fossil fuels, uh, the base power. So that equalizes out over time, and it's going to be less than what they're going to pay. I mean, I guess what you'd say is it's going to be less than what they're going to pay for bringing on new natural gas over time or a new, where there to be new coal fired, any other form of base power. It's going to be less over time. So a lot of it is going to come down to the regulatory structure that the states put in place and that their boards of public, uh, public utilities uh, negotiate with the utilities. And so that's the kind of thinking that needs to go on now as they take a look at what they're going to do, because it's very hard, even in today's regulatory environment, to bring on a new coal-fired power plant. And that's why I think we so desperately need a national energy plan that at least says clean, green, reliable, affordable, not picking winners within that. And let the marketplace help pick the winners, rather than have the government decide they like one technology over another because frankly, they don't know enough. And as you point out, there is so much new happening, for instance, in the nuclear world as well as in the green power world, <clears throat> that we can't imagine some of the things that are going to be available to us in the next five, 10 years. It comes down to the ability to, to plan for the long term. Yes, but, uh, something we're not terribly good at. <laughs> we think in three, two, three, four year cycles. Right, not uh, as a political cycle. And, uh, short term cycle. Year yeah. cycles. Yeah, one right here. Front. Yeah, why don't we make this the, the last question? Looks like we're, we're closing up. So. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Gunter, and I'm with a uh, NGO Beyond Nuclear okay. here in the D.C. area. And um, I, I'd like to go back to the issue of economics and financing of energy. I think that um, 
here in Maryland, for example, uh, I think we're pretty much familiar with the fact that uh, they were going to build uh, the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power station over on the, the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Constellation, however, uh, out of uh, Annapolis, was unwilling to finance a uh, $7.8 billion federal loan guarantee and uh, leaving France as the uh, only owner of Unistar, which is against the Atomic Energy Act, and as a result. Uh, but there was a two-year period there where uh, Unistar looked to other utilities in the United States to come up with the financing charge to be the domestic partner. And no utility stepped up to that challenge because uh, they are not willing to risk any skin in this game anymore because it's so financially risky. Uh, in Georgia and South Carolina, what you see is that the electric rate payers are in fact financers in advance of receiving the service. And, uh, but you know, in, in, in contrast to that, the United States deployed 13 gigawatts of wind energy, um, according to the American Wind Energy Association in 2012. Uh, uh, the uh, Google Corporation uh, is laying 189 miles of uh, high voltage DC uh, transmission line off the coast of New Jersey as part of a first vertebrae of the Atl Atlantic wind connection from New York all the way down to uh, Virginia. And so we're seeing the, um, you know, we, we are seeing financing and we're seeing expansion in all these areas but nuclear power. So I'm wondering if you could explain um, if, in fact, utilities are not willing, uh, like Exelon Nuclear, are not willing to, to cover their, even the financing of these uh, extraordinarily expensive projects, who do, you, who do you think will? Maybe this is an appropriate one to finish on. This is, this is your, you sure, make, make your final case. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the implication is that the winds are and the solar are inexpensive or a lot less expensive. They, in fact, incur some huge costs, and they cannot, not insignificantly, some of them are the pushback. I mean, if you look at the proposed wind process, wind cape farm up at up in the Cape, uh, some of the most prominent environmentalists I know, uh, starting with the Kennedys, were against it and have been pushing back hard against it. So it's not as if it's a, it's a smooth path. And you do have the four other nuclear reactors being built and the 12 that are online. Right now, most of the decisions are being made because of natural gas. I hope we do more with wind. I hope we do more. We're going solar at our farm. We already farm is solar, and the, and the house is about to become solar. So I am a big proponent of and all of the above. But I don't believe, again, looking at the overall mix of power of electricity that you're going to be able to meet, that we are going to as a nation be able to meet our energy needs for growth, the 28% plus whatever happens after 2040, which will be continued growth, fast enough with just the green power, uh, just the renewable power. Uh, nuclear is green, it's not a renewable because uranium is a finite source. We understand that. But I would far prefer, frankly, to see more investment in the nuclear than even the natural gas because of the methane leak you get from the natural gas during fracking process, um, which is a, a very dicey move. But overall, you're going to see challenges and costs. The cost of, of wind, of the type of wind you're talking about, particularly offshore, is, is going to be enormous. Laying those lines is going to be enormous. The um, the maintenance of them is expensive. So there are costs associated with everything. And that's why I think it's so important that we have a full discussion that lays out all these things, all these concerns, all these challenges, so that people can make a decision as to what's the right mix for them. How much do you rely on any one source? Where do you go? And, and how do you find the answers? And let's, let's look at them and decide. It's not going to be, wind power is it's not going to be as useful in Nebraska, well, probably is actually with a tornado, but they all get torn out. Um, they go through there. And actually, a joke about it is not a joke. I 
you know, someone that had that happened to them with a windmill. So there are downsides, there are downsides with everything. There are challenges with everything. But you do have utilities that are willing to move forward, that they want the loan guarantees, yes, because they are big, expensive. Eight billion dollars is, is a lot of money. But it's not as if wind is going to come online for nothing. And the same with, with anything new on power. Great. Well, I think that's a, that's a good place to, to finish up. Uh, Governor Whitman, thank you for your support of ASP as always, and thank you for...